Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Crime Family. So we're very excited because in this episode we're going to be discussing the Adnan Syed case. And for all you true crime lovers out there, you probably are quite familiar with this case. There is of course the Serial Podcast and the Undisclosed Podcast, both of which do, you know, full seasons just on this one case and they're very, very good. There's also an HBO documentary called The Case Against Adnan Syed. And there's also a book written by Rabia Chowdhury called Adnan story, the search for truth and justice after serial. So these are the four main sources of material that we're going to be using to discuss this case. And we actually ended up having to break it up into two parts because it was quite a lengthy discussion. There's in no way going to be a deep dive into the nitty gritty details of the case because quite frankly, those other resources do a much better job of that than we ever could. But we're going to be just discussing our main takeaways of the case and why we believe that Adnan Syed is totally innocent. And it's actually a very interesting discussion. So we're going to start off the episode with just a brief overview of the main people involved in the case, as well as just an overview of like, what happened. That way, if you aren't familiar with the case, you can still follow along with this episode. But if you are interested in hearing more about this case and in more detail than we'll ever get to get into, then definitely take a listen to the Serial Podcast and the Undisclosed Podcasts. They're both very, very great. So with that being said, let's get started. So yes, like I said in the intro, it's the Adnan Syed case and the first like 10 minutes or so of this episode is just going to be devoted to giving you a breakdown of the major players involved as well as just a general overview of what happened in the case. So that way you can still enjoy this episode and enjoy our discussion even if you aren't super familiar with the case. But like I said, if you want the true experience, we do recommend you go and take a listen to those other podcasts, watch the HBO documentary as well as read Rabia's book because it has so much interesting detail and although just to be warned, it's going to leave you very angry, very frustrated because there is a lot of injustices in this case and we'll get into a little bit of that in our discussion but in this first part we're going to be discussing the major takeaways such as Jay we're also going to be discussing Heyman Lee's car and some of the evidence that was looked at or not looked at in that case we're also going to be looking into Adnan Syed's defense attorney and kind of where she dropped the ball and some interesting points like that so that's kind of where we go in this first episode but like I said I'm going to give you a brief rundown of the case um, and I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about the major players. So this case involves the disappearance and murder of 18-year-old high school student Heyman Lee. She was last seen on January 13th of 1999 and her body was found about a month later on February 9th of 1999. So shortly after she went missing, a lot of her friends were a little bit concerned but there had been talks previously that she wanted to go to California to visit her biological father. So some people thought that she had actually went to California and they weren't super worried about her um, but then a few days after her disappearance, there was a birthday party for one of her best friends that she had been planning for weeks that she didn't attend and she never even called anyone, said why she wasn't coming and that was what really made people start to worry. And like I said, her body was found on February 9th of 1999 by a man named Alonzo Sellers. He was in the area, he was walking through the woods and he saw um, some hair sticking up out of underneath this log in the wooded part of Lincoln Park. And he immediately called the police and the police found Heyman Lee's body and the investigation began. Now, very shortly after the investigation began, they zeroed in on a man named Adnan Syed. And he was a 17-year-old high school senior and he was Heyman Lee's ex-boyfriend. They had actually dated the year previously they went to junior prom together and they were kind of like the the it couple at the school but they did break up because their families were very religious from different backgrounds and their parents were just very strict didn't want them to date so it kind of put a strain on their relationship and things fizzled out 
At the time of her disappearance, Heyman Lee was dating 22-year-old Don Kleindenst, and she had moved on, Adnan had moved on, and for all intents and purposes, and what for most people's accounts, it was a pretty um, amicable breakup. Even though they were disappointed, they were, you know, in love, they were teens, so they did break up and they were quite sad and upset, but it was seemed amicable and they still remained close friends. The police received an anonymous phone call shortly after Heyman Lee's body was found, saying that they needed to focus on Adnan as a prime suspect. And once they looked into this, they never stopped looking at Adnan. Even when there was evidence that would point to other people or point them to other leads, they never stopped looking at Adnan. So the case blew wide open when a man named Jay Wilds, who was a 19 year old um, that was kind of an acquaintance of Adnan's, had a confession. His story was that Adnan had told him on January 13th that he was going to kill Heyman Lee after school that day he says that he was actually shown Heyman Lee's body by Adnan and that he helped Adnan bury her the night of January 13th in Lincoln Park where she was eventually found and this is a huge accusation and on the surface you think you know why would this random guy who's 19 years old just come to the police with this confession saying that he was basically an accessory to murder if it never happened but there's details in Jay's story and just in the events surrounding this investigation that would lead all of us to believe that this is totally concocted it's not even true and you might think that's crazy but I mean it is a crazy case so due to Jay's testimony he leads them to Heyman Lee's car and his story quote-unquote checks out according to the police's theory and they arrest Adnan on February 28th of 1999 and it's pretty crazy but we're actually recording this episode on February 28th 2021 and it wasn't planned that way it just so happened it's crazy so exactly 22 years ago uh, today was when he was arrested and it's just a crazy case and he was eventually tried for first-degree murder and was convicted and just given a life sentence for the murder of, ha of his ex-girlfriend Heyman Lee and so it seems like a pretty open, you know, seems pretty straightforward, typical homicide case and seems, you know, open and shut. The 17 year old guy, you know, he was a jilted ex-lover and he killed her and was sentenced to life in prison. You know, it seems pretty straightforward, but there are so many details in this case that lead us to believe that there's just such injustice. And if you read the, you know, Rabia's book, you read, you watch the HBO documentary or you listen to these po those two podcasts I mentioned, you will come to the understanding as well that this case was so controversial and it's such an injustice. We believe that he's totally innocent of the crime and that the real killer is still out there. We're gonna discuss some of the details of the case that lead us to believe these things. So like I said, we kind of just started recording and started talking about the case. So it's kind of just a, a general back and forth conversation and it is very, very interesting. So it's a little different than the episodes we've done previously and it it does fit into our theme you know we do cases where people kill their loved ones or family members and i mean this guy's in jail for life for for killing his ex-girlfriend um and we believe he's wrongly convicted so that's kind of where we started off with the conversation and it just um we get into some of the details so that's a very bare bones kind of overview of the case some of the main players so when we bring up those names that those kind of the background of the case and we're not doing a deep dive there's probably going to be some information we're going to gloss over or maybe that we don't get into because quite frankly we'd have to do you know a 12 episode podcast like those other ones so we aren't going to be doing that because you know like i said those other ones do it much better than we ever could but i just wanted to give you that basic overview um of the case and if i've piqued your interest you can go ahead and listen to those other podcasts and then come back to us and then you can really enjoy this conversation because obviously you're going to get the full experience and you're really going to get into our discussion when you know like the full details um so here it is i actually am quite new to this case like i only listened to the serial podcast like in December of last year so it's only been like two months for me that I've actually known about this case which is pretty crazy so I'm, I'm late on the bandwagon but um as soon as I heard the podcast I became very very obsessed with you know the case and the follow-up podcast Undisclosed um goes into the nitty-gritty details of the trial that serial doesn't cover and what I've basically realized is that if you only listen to the serial podcast you're probably going to leave with maybe some reasonable doubt, kind of a 50-50, did he do it, did he not do it? You realize that Serial kind of glossed over a lot of information and didn't include very important information that would make it very clear that he is innocent of this crime. Because um, I know when I listened to Serial for the first time, at the end of it, I was like, 
prob like I'm pretty sure like he probably didn't do it, but then there was certain points that they would bring up that I was like, but like maybe, and I was like definitely like going over it in my mind, thinking did he or didn't he? Um, but that's really only like the start of the story is serial. So Katie or, and Steph, when you guys listened to serial, like what was your initial reaction to the case? Uh, like you said, it was like, oh, like maybe he did, maybe he didn't. It was kind of 50-50, but there was definitely reasonable doubt. So if I was on that jury, I would, you know, definitely have that reasonable doubt and he would not have been convicted. When I was listening to this case, I was like, I don't think it was 50-50. I think I was more like he did not do it. And there was like so much misinformation and so much like that was not investigated. That I was just shocked of how it turned out. Yeah, like Katie said, I, like at the end of Serial, I was like, okay probably like pretty sure that he didn't do it but i know for sure that like i wouldn't have convicted him obviously like just based on the, the basic facts of this case like if i was on a jury there's no way that i would ever convict and the fact that they did convict is pretty pretty crazy to me but um i want to talk about jay because you can't really talk about this case without talking about jay in some way and he really is like the basis or the crux of this case because obviously it was his testimony um along with the quote unquote cell phone records that was the prosecution's main main case against Adnan and they used Jay's story. So Jay said, um, for those of you who don't know Jay's story was that um he had Adnan had lent him his car that day and his cell phone was um in the car as well. So Jay had both Adnan's car and phone that day and he says that Adnan told him that he was going to kill Heyman Lee after school on that day and he told Jay to wait for his phone call Adnan was going to call his own phone that he knew Jay had when the deed was done and that's when he would um for Jay to come pick him up so at 236 is the time that the prosecution claims that that call came in uh they say that Adnan killed Hay um in the Best Buy parking lot uh by she died by manual strangulation so they say that he killed her in her car, then called Jay from the Best Buy parking lot at the, from the payphone um, and told Jay to come pick him up. And Jay went to the Best Buy and Jay says that Adnan showed him Hay's body in the trunk of her own car. And then he says that the two of them drove around and then they eventually buried Hay's body around 730 that night in Lincoln Park. So that was kind of like the basic timeline of events, according to Jay. But if you watch the documentary, um, The Case Against Adnan Syed, or you read Rabia's book, you'll know that Jay's story has changed so many times. Even if you listen to Serial, you'll know that Jay's story has changed so many times that I don't even know like what version that I just told. Like, I don't know what ver if that was the <laughs> eventual version or if that was like the original version. But basically, it was one of the versions or maybe a mix of all the different details that put together into one one story but um what do you guys think about jay i found him sketchy from the get-go like i don't i just think his his stories just never really made sense to me oh no i just i never really un understood his story i mean he frustrates me so yeah and as we'll as we get into this we'll definitely talk about it more but it's just so obvious how his story is there to like his story is shaped around the evidence that the police are showing him it's not like he's telling them that the, the police are like oh yeah this makes sense it's the other way around it's like the police are like this is what happened this is what we have so can you tell us a story that fits with that and then he does that and then as the police are like oh we made a mistake here this actually didn't happen at this time and it wasn't actually at this place can you tell us a story that, you know, fits with that? And then he changes what he says to fit exactly what the police are saying. So it's it's just, it gets super obvious that, yeah, he is just, you know, like manipulating his story to fit exactly with what the police want to hear. Yeah, like they mention in the documentary that the original version of the events that they had based on the cell phone records was wrong because they put some of the cell phone pings in the wrong location. So, but they had at that point already crafted a story from Jay about that fit those cell locations but then when they had to move the the locations because to fix it and make it correct then it didn't match his story anymore so then when they did, then they had to like change the entire story to fit with those new locations so it's like very clear any 
person who just looks at this on a very basic level can understand like it ain't the truth basically like you don't change your story that many times if it's actually the truth and yeah like even when you're listening to the documentary um one of the lawyers is talking about how they mislabel one of the cell towers so i think it was supposed to be b but they labeled it c or c and it was supposed to be b or something and so even his final story doesn't add up because the, the final cell tower that his story matches up to was actually wrong so in reality it, sh- it should be shifted but he made up this other story to fit with the you know with the misprint of this tower so it still doesn't make sense yeah like when i was watching like when i listened to serial and then i watched the documentary there was an interview they showed with jay and they're like pointing to the piece of paper that like kind of like what he's supposed to be saying when he's when he's like describing his story and i'm thinking like that's so like what's the word so corrupt yeah so corrupt and so like just ridiculous how like it's not jay's story it's basically what the police are telling him to say so yeah in the documentary how is that even allowed well yeah in the documentary it's susan simpson is the is the lawyer who was like investigating this this case and she also does the undisclosed podcast with rabia chowdhury and colin miller but yes she is the one who is pointing out when you listen to the audio of the police interviews like you can hear like a tapping in the audio whenever jay gets like confused or he doesn't seem like he remembers the story that he's telling then like you can hear these taps and then all of a sudden Jay, oh, it comes to him all of a sudden, like what he was supposed to say. And um, in one part of the audio, he says top spots, um, which Susan is saying is at the top. Then he goes to the top of the following page and then continues on his story. Like he's telling it like, oh, as if, you know, like they're like reminding him like tops, like he was trying to remember like the order that the story was supposed to go in. And he's like, oh yeah, top spots, meaning the top of the page. And then all of a sudden it's like, it's very like he remembers it like it was yesterday. Well, it's just like if you can picture just like the the police having all these maps and kind of like a route that they believe maybe like highlighted on these maps, and then they're like pointing at different spots, different cell towers, and like Jay's just like filling in the details. It's like oh yeah, we took a ride down this road, we got here. That's why they're the pings off this cell tower, and then they point somewhere else, and he's like oh yeah, then we did this, we called this person. So it really is just like the police just like showing him exactly what they want him to say and then he just says says it makes up a story so that it fits grabia says at one point that in the initial story that jay gave there was this whole like convoluted thing about how after after jay picked up adnan at the best buy they drove around they went to like this random park that was like miles away they went and like there and they like smoked weed and then for like a little bit and then they went back and then he dropped adnan off at school for track practice which it seems like a really random like detail to add, but that's because it was like a random cell ping like that was like ten miles off the route, and then when they like realized that that was wrong, then all of a sudden you never hear that story from Jay again. Like that never happened. The initial story was he was talking about it in so much detail about like where they went and like how they got there and like what they did there, and then and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, never mind, that never happened. Yeah, I think another thing to mention, too, is that everyone that talks about Jay in the documentaries and the podcast is saying that he lied about everything. So it's like everybody knows that Jay lies. So I feel like him making up the story to the police, it's like the ultimate lie for him, whether, you know, he's like practicing his whole life for this, you know, this huge story that he has to make up. So he sounds convincing. It's because he does this all the time anyway with like random facts, random stories that he tells to his friends. So for me, it's not even that far of a stretch for him you know, to like, you know, I don't want to say loving it, but just like, you know, it's like second nature to him for him just to be going along with these stories. I don't even, but I don't even think it it does sound convincing. Like when you listen to like the the audio tape of like the police interviewing him, like that does not sound like someone who even knows like what story they're telling. There's so many gaps in it. He makes so many mistakes. He's like, oh wait, oh, never mind. If you're just telling the truth about what happened, like why do you have to like, I don't know. It just seems to me like he's like remembering this like rehearsed, narrative that like didn't even happen but like if you're just saying the truth about what actually happened you don't have to memorize i don't know if you just listen to the audio tapes of those interviews like it's clear very clear to me that's why i said i felt like he was sketchy from the get-go because like just hearing his voice didn't seem like he was telling the truth but i mean if you're like trying to think you're with the cops maybe you're nervous you know you don't want to say the wrong thing you don't want to say something that's going to like further implicate you so you're thinking you don't want to say the wrong thing but it doesn't sound like he's like 
a bad actor making stuff up, you know, that's totally unbelievable. You know, it, it, it does sound like, you remember, he's only like 19 and he's sitting here with the cops trying to please them. So, I mean, it does kind of make sense that he's like trying to think ahead. It doesn't sound, you know, like I said, like a, someone that's like a bad actor that's doing a really bad job. I mean, it, it does, it could sound like a nervous 19 year old kid talking to the cops that actually does, you know, have a bad rap in the past. Like he's a drug dealer. He's, you know, done things that the cops could get him for. So it makes sense that he sa- he could sound nervous and, you know, trying to get his story straight in his own head. I was actually watching. Um, so Rabia gave she gave a speech to uh, Claremont McKenna College and she's talking about the case and like where they are at in like his appeals process and stuff like that. Um, and she actually says in that speech that um Jay's attorney, who was his attorney at the time of this investigation back in 99, um, emailed her uh, somewhat recently, I think in the last couple of years, and said that, you know, the attorney was in the room with Jay when the prosecution was basically saying to Jay that we are going to pin this murder on you unless you give us a story that counters that. So basically saying, if you don't, if you don't pin this on Adnan, then we're going to put but then we're going to convict you or going to charge you with the murder and we're going to convict you. And they said that we're going to charge you in Baltimore County, which is an all white County. And Jay is a black 19 year old male um, in the nineties who it would not have gone well for him if he did get those charges. So they basically threatened him and they said that if you don't give us a story that we're going to go with against Adnan, then we're going to put it on you. And so in a way, and I don't want to, I know Jay is a very <laughs> controversial figure in this whole thing, but in a way, like Jay was a victim too. Like, what are you going to do? He's 19 years old. Like he doesn't want to go to jail forever. Like obviously like if the police are telling him this, the prosecution's telling the prosecutor's telling him this, a 19 year old kid who's thinking about life in jail, like obviously he's going to do whatever he can to not have that happen. And Jay and Adnan's relationship. I don't know. I think it's a little bit unclear what the relationship with is, but according to Adnan, they were not really best friends. I think maybe like he would buy weed off of Jay or something. And like they would hang out now and then, but like, they were never super, super close. So it's not like this is like his best friend that he's pinning this murder on. It's kind of like this guy that he knows who's like, he was, you know, kind of an acquaintance with, or maybe a little bit more of an acquaintance, but you know what I mean? Like, it's not like it's his, his lifelong friend or anything, but I don't know. I think Jay is in somewhat a victim in that sense. And also one of the lawyers in that documentary go- made a good point. Like at the very beginning, Jay was in this weird position where he wasn't being charged with anything. So he didn't actually require a lawyer and like they weren't going to provide him one because he didn't have any criminal charges so he was there didn't have any lawyer and it wasn't mandatory for him to have a lawyer so he was like yeah he was in this weird position of the limbo it's like either we charge you and then you can have a lawyer or you just talk to us now without one and just you know kind of tell us what we want to hear and i think they also mentioned that if he did have charges put against him they could have transferred him over to baltimore county which had the death penalty i think so i mean if that's on you as well then Obviously, you're going to, you know, cooperate with the cops as much as you can, for sure. Is that even allowed, threatening people like that? Well, no. And, like, and they also mentioned... like, how they could get away with it. No. Well, and to know. And that's why, like, they... In, in they mentioned that they brought him in at, like, 3.05 p.m. for the interview. It didn't turn the tape on until 6 o'clock that night. It was three hours later. So, you know, they had this whole story. They probably threatened him, said all this shit then turned the tape on after he was like scared shitless and he had this, this whole story they wanted him to say mapped out so i mean that's not le- that's not legal anymore now you turn you turn that tape on as soon as you get in that room but back then you know it it, it didn't matter that is so fucking frustrating to me. like it drives me crazy like i don't understand how people can get away with stuff like that i know and like how shitty you think jay is for saying all this shit and like stuff that's not even true but i mean they're like the cops are behind it as well so yeah Ugh. Like, so annoying. You can't see my face right now, but like I'm literally like red as a beat. I'm so mad at this case. Just gets me so angry. So Adnan's original story, and the, it's also frustrating too because like there is no in this whole case, there's no like smoking gun. There's nothing like that will definitively say like he is innocent. Like there's no DNA evidence that was ever tested or proven or anything. Like there's nothing that points to someone else or points to Adnan himself. So it totally is, in my opinion, still an unsolved murder because there is. The person I believe who actually committed the crime is not Adnan and is obviously still out there. So, um, but Adnan, Adnan's 
story from that day like is a little bit frustrating because he kept saying i don't remember what happened that day like i don't have a clear memory and like it's like oh how convenient that like you don't remember this story but it's like if it's like an average day you're not gonna remember it like we're in february right now like if someone were to ask me what did i do on january 13th like a month ago i'd be like i don't i don't know like like you know like it's not like you're not gonna have like a detailed account of like every moment of the day and so it is frustrating that he of course didn't have you know a good memory of what happened on that day and also there was stories that he was like smoking weed he was like stoned the whole day which is like makes him not have a memory of most of the day anyway but um you know his family or it was during ramadan so he's going to the mosque like every night he was supposed to be leading prayer that night um which was like a huge thing in his family it was a big accomplishment for him so the fact that like I don't know, they say it's like a big stretch that he murdered his ex-girlfriend, buried her in Lincoln Park, um, went through like the muddy woods to bury her and then shows up right at the right at the mosque at 8 p.m. to do the prayer like a half an hour later. Like that, like his family's like, there's no way that happened. And like they remember him, that he was there, like he gave the prayer like he was supposed to. So it doesn't even fit with the prosecution's timeline because they say like they go on like the 236 is when the call from Best Buy came um, that I not telling jay that he killed her and then they say that they buried her around 7 7 7 30 p.m at lincoln park because that's what matched the like cell phone pings like their final version of the cell phone pings so that was the story they went with but his family was like there's no way that happened it's just adnan says like yes jay did have his car did have his cell phone that day because adnan was really close friends with jay's girlfriend stephanie um it was like adnan and stephanie were friends for a long time and it was stephanie's birthday and jay hadn't gotten her gift so adnan was said i'm going to give you my car so that you can go buy her a gift um and his cell phone was in the car um and this was in like 99 so it's probably like wasn't like now where people's cell phones are like their lifeline they have to have them with them every minute of the day so like and a phone was just a phone back then it wasn't like you know you could just make calls on it so it wasn't like i don't know it seemed like it could be believable that he just left his phone in the car and didn't have it with him for the day so like those things are plausible because at the time of serial i was thinking like oh how convenient that jay just happened to have his car and his phone i don't know there was also like a strict no phone policy at their school so if he was caught with a phone he would have been in big trouble so it makes sense that he would just leave it there to avoid that altogether like, he probably did that every day. He left his phone in the glove compartment every day while he was at school. So it's not, like, a stretch. Yeah. I think it's perfectly reasonable that that is what happened. And Jay, that story fits that he, Jay had his car so he could go get his girlfriend a birthday gift. I don't know. I don't think that's suspicious or anything. And so I I don't know. But I, I think what's frustrating, too, is, like, obviously Serial is, like, what brought this case to to the world and like it was the phenomenon and everyone like knew about this case because of serial but i feel like there's so much information that serial just kind of they told a really good story of like who done it like did he or didn't he i feel like they were trying to focus so much on like the did he or didn't he that it was like they kind of glossed over a lot of information that i think was so obviously pointing to his innocence and obviously in serial they're still very suspicious of jay and they do mention that his story changed all those all those times um i think in serial they mentioned like trying to track Jay, Jay's story is like tracking someone's dream or something like it's it's like just trying to track this thing that like that didn't even happen or I don't know like it's it's just weird yeah like I still can't track Jay's story like I still don't even know what the final version is like if you had to ask me what Jay's story is like I can't even like figure it out because there's so many different versions and he says so many different things at different times like I still don't even know what it is and I've listened to hours and hours and hours of this case but anyway um but also there was there's stuff that has come out since serial so they didn't gloss over everything there's some things that they just didn't know back then which are coming out now to make you know it interesting the thing is is so like that day january 13th was a wednesday and like they've talked to so many people that adnan like where his whereabouts can be accounted for like almost every hour of that day and everything that jay is saying just like isn't true like where he was after school people saw him after school he was at track practice like his his coach could talk about that and where he was after that he's at the mosque and like had supper with his dad like his whole day is accounted for yet somehow they were able to squeeze in all this stuff that wasn't true and convict him like it just it's it blows my mind but yeah and his alibi for like that after school they never talked to her during court like right that's where one of his where his lawyers messed up was they didn't talk to his one really crucial alibi at the time they're saying that this happened so that's yeah that's a big thing but i mean now looking back you can see that his whole day is mapped out and it makes sense and people are there to say that yeah that actually did happen the way that he says it did and it's not like he had like any animosity against 
hey because like like he said he was it was just like a mutual breakup and like even his the teacher at the time that they hit when they did the interview during like the documentary that we watched she was saying like people break used to break up all the time they're teenagers they break up they like talk about it but they said like anon wasn't very like he was upset about it but it like he wasn't mad about it he wasn't angry he didn't he wasn't there was no like rage he was, he was like there. moving he was like moving on yeah. like he was you know he wasn't like and they were like, and, like still like, close friends at the time she went missing and like he understood because like of their both their backgrounds like that's why they couldn't be together is because of their backgrounds and they couldn't see each other and their parents get mad yeah and he was like apparently seeing like a bunch of other girls yeah so it was like he was moving on and, and she also, was moving on too yeah so and I, just, also, I think some of like the the racism or like the the cultural just like not understanding comes in because they're saying it was like an honor killing like that if your wife dishonors you you know you can take care of that you know get rid of them and that's accepted so that they're kind of thinking like maybe that happened and she dumped him so he had to kill her because she dishonored him so that that's mentioned and it's just kind of crazy that that it gets taken this far yeah like that whole like narrative like there's such a like a racist narrative that's like underlining this whole case and it's like obviously people who just don't understand and Rabia's book goes into a lot of detail about his culture and like goes on and talks about how how crazy it was that this narrative was kind of what the prosecution stuck with and used against him um and the whole thing about the honor killing yeah like that does come up and they try to like paint this picture that he was like he felt wronged because she was moving on with this guy named don but like it's a, like they interviewed Don around the time and he, I think it's in Serial that they mentioned this. She says that Don was saying that the prosecution got mad at him because he wasn't making Adnan out to be creepy. Like they were trying to paint this picture of like Adnan was like the angry and bitter ex-boyfriend who was like, you know, jealous of Don and all this stuff. But like yeah, Adnan and Don had actually met before he went missing and it wasn't like a angry meeting. It was a cordial, um, like obviously they weren't best friends, but. There was no, like, incident to point to at a time when, like, Adnan had beat up Don or something because he was angry. Like, there's no evidence of that whatsoever. So to say that he was this jilted ex-lover is just ridiculous with no evidence. Yeah, and Adnan was an American. Like, he was a he was born in America. Not that it matters even if he was born in Pakistan. But, I mean, so he was born and raised in America. And he was it was kind of like he was more like a cultural Muslim where he followed he went to the mosque and stuff but he was very much an american teenager he was you know hiding what he was doing from his parents he wasn't allowed to date but he was dating multiple girls you know he smoked weed whatever typical teenager things so it, it wasn't like he was really strictly following this so it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense at all and also it is kind of sad that um it's mentioned in the documentary that his father wouldn't go to some of the hearings because the way that he, he looked because he said he was like this muslim man with like this big beard and he didn't want like the judge to see him and that to kind of taint his thoughts of the case that this was remind him that this was a muslim like a pakistani muslim family which is really sad yeah like i was just gonna mention like they were talking about like how like they didn't give him they didn't grant him bail because he was afraid that he would he had so many connections in the community to like pakistan and they might like take off and go to Pakistan, Pakistan and they'll never be able to come back because they can't extradite him or something stupid like that. Like, stupid thing to even consider. Well, yeah, that was like the whole, like, argument at, at his bail hearing and that's why he was denied bail because they came up with this whole argument of, yeah, he knows people in Pakistan who are, he's going to flee to Pakistan and then they're going to, like, change his identity and we'll never be able to find him. Like, it's so ridiculous like he was a typical he was a typical american teenager in many ways but they they use the fact that he was you know a muslim to to like paint this image and like of course islamophobia was alive and well back then just as it is now and it's like and it's sad that like you said his father would go to some of the some of the trial because like the fact that like that would have a factor on whether he was innocent or guilty just seeing this guy with like a big beard looks like father time or whatever like it's so i don't know it's so it's so makes me so mad i can't even like articulate really like fully what i'm trying what i'm thinking but it's just so infuriating and it, yeah and it's sad because like back then like racism was such a big thing and it here we are talking about it in 2021 and it's still a big thing like it hasn't changed at all and it just it's so ridiculous like those times have not changed at all you think we'd be get better at it but we're actually getting worse at it it's just so, it just blows my mind. It frustrates me to no end. It makes me mad. It makes me, yeah, it just makes me angry. 
all around. And also, too, like going back to the bail hearing, like they mention in the documentary and as well as um, the book, Adnan's story, they had his birth date wrong on his file um, or on the charges. So he was actually born in May of 1981. So at the time of his arrest, he was 17 years old because he was arrested in February of 99. And but they put his birth date as 1980. So they thought or I don't know if they thought or just according to the document, he was 18. So because he was 18, therefore an adult, and he was charged with first degree murder, he was denied bail. But if he was 17, it would have been different rules because he would have been considered a minor and could have possibly gotten bail. So it's like, did they like purposely just fudge the document on his, like, it's so frustrating. Like, it's, it's, and there's like 17 year old kid who has like no, and probably like couldn't grasp the gravity of the situation at the time, but like, I think it has no control over this. And it's like the police who just didn't want to do their job. They're like, oh, it's the easy way out to just like pin it all on him and no one's going to question it. That's why like when they got that anonymous call that pointed to Adnan, like, they basically just filtered out any evidence that even pointed to anyone else. And yeah, and there's also like yeah, the sketchy things that his lawyer was saying, like how his lawyer came to the police station or the courthouse or something was saying, I'm here, I want to talk to Adnan. And the cops were saying, well, he hasn't actually asked for a lawyer, so we don't actually have to technically provide him with one until he says that. Even though his lawyer was waiting there to get in, they still wouldn't let him in because Adnan, you know, the 17-year-old kid didn't ask for his lawyer right away, so... But yeah, it's like they had this tunnel vision. And I think once they found out how, like, how they could manipulate Jay, it was almost like, this is going to be so easy. And, like, they just went from there and never, never got, off, like, off the add on. They couldn't move on from that. And in the documentary, when they're recounting the morning that he was arrested, because apparently, like, Jay went in for his final. He, w he had been interviewed a couple times before that. And then he went in, like, late on the 27th of February. And he was interviewed into the early morning of the 28th. And then it was, like, early morning, like, something like 5 or 6 a.m. on the 28th. They basically, like, busted into Adnan's house and arrested him, like, out of his bed. And, like, that picture that they took of him that's, like, from his bedroom. Like, I don't know. It just makes me sad thinking about it. Like, you can see, like... He was asleep. Yeah. Like, and it's just, like, I don't know. Like, you can just see in his face. I don't know. Just, like, the total sadness in his eyes like it just makes me sad because it's like and obviously he didn't know then that it's going to be like 22 years later still be going on like he thought oh maybe they'll like it must be this huge mistake like they'll take me in for questioning and they'll release me so I, even at that time but like every time i see that picture it just makes me so sad yeah i feel like every step of the way he probably thought oh like this is just one little thing but like it'll be fine i'll get over it and then something else happens and he's like oh okay this is just another little thing it'll be fine I'll get out of this. And like, and then it finally it just like comes down to it where no, like you're not getting out of this basically. And 22 years later, he still hasn't gotten out of it. So it, yeah, it's super, super sad. Unless like they mentioned in, um, in Serial, like maybe he actually is a sociopath. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. Well, that's what, well, that's, yeah, that's Robbia says that too. And like that speech that she gave, um, that I watched, it's like, they're trying to, it's like, it's either one extreme or the other. It's like he's either a total like sociopath who has like no conscience or he's completely innocent and like didn't just didn't do it just based on the evidence. And it's just like when you look at the just the evidence that's in this case or the lack of evidence um, in a lot of cases, it's, it's just so clear to see that like the police obviously had an objective. And, and when you look at like just the evidence, it's clear that the the police, whether they were like racially motivated or they were just had some other. I don't know, like what? I don't really, obviously, I don't, we'll never know what was going through their minds, but like, I just don't know what would make you think we're just going to like ignore every piece of evidence that like doesn't go with our theory. Like, we don't care who actually did this. I was trying to decide, like, do they think in their heart of hearts that he actually did do it? And that's why they're just ignoring all like the evidence that questions, or do they like know blatantly, like, oh yeah, he probably didn't, but like, it's probably easy to like pin it on him. But like, as a police officer, why would you not just want to like find the real person? Like, I just can't think of, like, what they had against Adnan versus it has to be racially motivated. It probably was, but, like, I don't know. I just can't. Yeah, that's one thing that, like, I can't figure out. It's, like, what is the motive from the police? I don't know. I I, don't, I can't figure that out. They just didn't want to do their job, basically. Yeah, and... like, it was, Adnan was, like, the easy, easy way out, basically. Yeah, I was, like, I was just going to totally agree, because when I was watching the documentary and I was watching, I was listening to Serial and all the other podcasts and things of people who did in this case and i'm like there is no motive for the police like, there's no motive for the like i don't understand like the motive for the police i don't know there's nothing there to like suggest that he did it because there was no dna evidence found like his dna at all well there was well there was 
his DNA, no, but like there was like some DNA evidence that was pulled from Hayes' car, but it was never tested. That's yeah. the thing too. It's like a lot of stuff was just not tested for DNA. I mean, yeah, they, they, found, they found like they found fingerprints in Hayes' car that didn't match Jay, didn't match Hay, and didn't ma- match Adnan. So it's like, who else is this person? Like they just they had the like they they came to this wall and they're like, okay, well that doesn't really match up with our story, so let's you know ditch that, which is what they did throughout the whole thing. Yeah. And obviously, this is probably not uncommon. Like, I'm sure there's lots of other, like, millions of other cases out there where it's a similar thing. It's like, and it reminds me a lot of, like, the Stephen Avery case and, like, making a murder. It's like, you know, the police just have it out for this one person or just for whatever reason, they just focus, I don't know. There's completely, like, ignoring evidence that doesn't fit their theory and, like, embracing evidence and, like, standing by it quote-unquote evidence that like isn't even evidence it's just like a fabricated like story that i don't know like the fact that they could even go in there and like threaten jay and say like we're gonna pin this on you unless you like basically sell out this guy who had no no part in it like to me that's just so vile that they could even do that yeah and maybe at the beginning like they did think it was adnan but then once they got so far in with jay and like realizing that oh maybe we like we messed this up it, like it was they couldn't go back like they had already threatened jay and they already had this deep story with jay like what are they going to do be like oh actually like you know that there's they can't go back from that so that, maybe yeah. that, that's kind of what happened they're like we, we yeah, gotta see this, like we gotta like, see this through to like I, I don't i don't think they wanted to prove them prove to everybody that they were wrong like they're like hurt their pride of as police officers like oh we yeah, did like, something, something wrong for once in our yeah. lives something stupid well, not once in their lives probably they do it lots of times but, but like i think like Getting someone to admit that they were wrong is, like, probably one of the hardest things. Like, people, nobody wants to, like, you know, they have too much pride or their ego. Like, no one's going to sit up there and be like, oh, yeah, we did this horrible thing and threatened Jay. But, oh, like, we have to go back on it now because what we're actually trying to push is not even accurate. Yeah, like, being wrong is one thing, but then admitting you were shady as well is, I think, what kind of puts them over the edge to be like, yeah, we, there's no going back from this. So that's probably exactly how it snowballed. That's just gross to me. Just just admit that you were wrong. These are people's lives at stake. Like, either you admit that you're wrong and you get justice for Anon and justice for uh, Hay. There's both victims in this story. Like, her, she's a victim and he's also one too because you're treating him like shit. Yeah, like, I mean... Just, and just th- admit that you were wrong. But them admitting that and then, like, admitting what they did to threaten Jay, like... It's not just like, oh, we made made a mistake, let's move on. It's like, yeah, they would probably get fired and maybe even get charged Charged. charged against them as well. Yeah, so, yeah, that's just too much for them to accept. Yeah, it kind of comes back down to, like, self-preservation. Like, they're not going to say now. Like, they're not going to put their own life at stake and admit that. Even the same thing, like, back with Jay, like, when they threaten him and say it's going to be all pinned on you. He's 19 years old and he's... I don't know. Obviously, when you're faced with the prospect of going to life in prison, it's like, you're going to do what the police are telling you, basically. And I think they knew that. It's like, well, there's no way he's not going to cooperate if we're, like, threatening him with this. And it's so crazy to think that, like, how easily that can happen. Like, it happened here so easily and see how it... But, like, the fact is, like, even if it was just that, like, even if the police just went to Jay and did that and they had Jay's story and all that, that's bad enough. But then the fact that there's, like, so many other elements and so many other... So much other evidence that, like, should have been that should have surfaced during the trial that should have like just proved all of it to be bullshit but none of it either came into trial or like it was misconstrued or like completely fabricated it's crazy yeah it was like this perfect mix of like shady police and like shoddy lawyers and like just people not following up and like kids being kids not remembering not realizing how important things were to remember or speak up like it it was just like this, this perfect mix and like just yeah shitty it's also sad to like his defense attorney was just, like, shitty. She was just, like, a shit lawyer. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll get to her in a little bit, but... She oh, was just shitty I... all around. Just, well, she was actually, like, a really smart and, like, sought-after lawyer. She was actually, like, really good back in the day, but towards the end, that, there was just some things happening in her life, I think. Like, yeah, so, so, when you, so she's not the ideal lawyer, but when you think of, like, the prosecution going after him hard is bad enough, but then when your own lawyer isn't just sticking up for you, isn't defending you, like, this is the worst, I don't know, egregious... Well, yeah part of it all yeah th- there was also a theory that she was like trying to blow it on purpose because then she'd get the, pe- uh, the get to be a part of the appeals process which she'd get more money because like 
was dragging it out longer. Towards the end there, she was sick, and I think she was, they mentioned she was on, like, a lot of medications and stuff, wasn't she? Like, she had MS, and she had some other stuff going on, and she she messed up a lot of other cases, and she was, like, sued and disbarred and whatever, but we'll, we'll get into that, I guess. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about, like, we were going with evidence, certain evidence, so, like, Hay's car. So when they found Hay's car, so there was, like, a lot of stuff about this in the documentary and then in the book, um... And I don't actually think that Serial mentioned that much about Hayes' car. Um, that's kind of one of the details they glossed over. But um, in Hayes' car, like, they took pictures of the inside of the car when they found it. And I believe they found it the night of the, tw- of the, of the 27th. I think that's, like, Jay led them to the car, like, that night that he gave that, like, confession um, that led to Adnan's arrest. Um, but that they took pictures of the inside of the car and, like, the... There was a piece, I think it was a part of the steering column, or it was, or no, maybe it was the, uh, was it like the windshield wiper? I don't know, like that, I don't know. Yeah, one of those things that stick out, it might have been like the, uh, yeah, the windshield wiper stick. Yeah, um, it's, it's such a technical term, but um, it was off, unattached from uh, from where it was supposed to be, and it was sent for testing, and because they were trying to say that there was like a struggle inside the car that when... Adnan was strangling her. She was like, obviously, and she was very athletic. Like she was, you know, um, on a lot of sports teams and stuff. So they say like, she's someone who could put up quite a fight if someone was strangling her. But um, they said that like in this, in this fight that, that she must've kicked the, that piece off and it like broke off. But then when they sent it for testing, they realized that there was no like broken pieces, no like sharp edges, like something that would, that was broken off would have like some sort of broken pieces but they said that it was like off as if it had been like loosened and taken off not like something that just like got kicked off yeah it was like part of the steering column or something had been disconnected and i think um you know another podcast mentioned that that that's like one of the things that you would do if you were going to hotwire the car would be to dismantle that piece to get into the ignition part of it yeah so um they're saying like instead of it yeah, instead of being kicked off, it was, like, taken off to hotwire the car. Um, because the whole thing was, there was, you know, debate that the car wasn't there for the six weeks from when she went missing to when she was found. Like, that's a six-week period of time. Um, or, sorry, from when she went missing to when an Adnan was arrested, it was six weeks. And, um, yeah, they're saying so... Cyril doesn't mention this, but, like, when they removed the car, like, they looked at, like, the turf underneath where the car was, and they said that, like, just based on if a car was parked there, and this is, like, February in Maryland, so it's, like, winter, I guess, but um, they said, like, just based on, like, the way that the the grass was that was underneath the car, they said if there was a car that was over that spot for six weeks, like, there would be a lot more, like, noticeably, like, brown or, like, dead grass from a car that's on top of it for six weeks. And they also said that there was, like, in the tire track or in the treads of the tires there was like some pieces of grass that like they sent for like forensic testing and like the analysis came back that it was like somewhat fresh grass so it's like there was that whole theory and then it's like okay the thing to hotwire the car is like taken off and then like the gr- the grass is like not six weeks dead <laughs> to say like oh that they moved the car to that location like shortly before jay's confession just to like match that story so that like, we'd be like oh he knows where it is he knows where the car was and he took them to the car when it's like no they could have just placed it there Ugh, it just makes me so mad to think about like it's kind of i don't know just that itself like why is the grass somewhat green yeah the grass the grass isn't going to be alive that like that's pulled out and it's like it's stuck in the tire treads right that's not even attached anymore there's no like you yeah Ugh. I don't and know. They, they mentioned like the amount of rain and snow like melted and then it rained there wouldn't be any grass in the treads of the car because it'd be washed away and that was still the it, the grass was still there so like if it was there for a long period of time and like and it rained it would have washed it away so that does like go to show you that the car wasn't there the day she died yeah and they said they could still look like there was still like fresh tire tracks in the mud that like wouldn't have lasted for six weeks yeah, and then they interview some of the people because it was apparent it was just like this like grassy lot like in this like kind of residential area and like they interviewed some of the people in the houses around that area and there's like there's no way that a car would sit there for six weeks like someone would have reported it like you know the cars don't sit there for that long um 
so the fact and like they interviewed the person in the house that was like directly across and there she's like there's no there's that car was not there for six weeks i would have noticed it if it was because that's not usual yeah and they would have called it in and the cops would have found it way before six weeks so it, it couldn't have been there for that long yeah so i think it's like fairly clear if you just think I don't know. I just think if you have like an ounce of common sense and you kind of put that all together, it's like this is looking very much like it was just like planted evidence or the car was moved from another location um, to that location to like fit again Jay's story. Like it all comes down to Jay. Like they had because he was the star witness. He was saying like Adnan told him that he was going to kill her. He's the one who showed it showed him Hay's body and he helped him bury her. So like obviously all of the testimony is going to ride on what he says. So it all comes back to him. Like they need what he says to match their story, but yeah, none and they, of it really does. Yeah, and they use this as proof. Like Jay said, it was here, and it was. So he's not lying <laughs> for once in yeah, his life. And, yeah, and initially, and um, and there's and Rabia even said his initial story was that they threw her her purse into the woods. Um, but then when they find the car, her purse is inside the car, and then all of a sudden, oh, oh yeah, like. You know, why would he say that he threw their purse, her purse out in the woods? And then I was, oh, look, they have to explain why the purse is actually in the, in the trunk of the car. Oh, well, no, like, okay, we didn't throw it into the woods. It's in the trunk of the car. Like, obviously he's lying. Like, it's so clear. Like, it was so annoying to me. Yeah, and why make up such weird details like that? That, like, you know, can't be proven or, you know, obviously the whole thing is made up. But I don't know. It, it's just, it's weird. Yeah. And going to I actually want to talk about, uh, lividity as well um which is like a huge also another huge piece of just forensic evidence um so when you say there's no i mean when you say there's no evidence in the case like there's no smoking gun evidence that like dna that points to like a named person that they can like easily point to so there's no like haha moment but there's a lot of like there's still forensic evidence that is suspicious but um they talk about in the documentary the um full frontal lividity um that was on Hay's body so like when she was found in her in the grave she was kind of like like twisted around like she wasn't laid flat down into the grave it was like she was sort of like contorted with like her arms sort of like you know behind her back and like her legs were like bent up so it wasn't like she was laying flat but when they did like the autopsy the medical examiner found that there was full frontal fixed lividity which lividity is like when when you die like if you if you die and you're like fall back and you're like lying on, flat on your back and you're not moved the blood will pool in a specific area of your body depending on how you're laid and how you're laid out so if you're like laying flat on your back all the blood will pool to your back um and it takes about eight to ten hours for the lividity to set so like if you're laying flat for eight to ten hours then you're gonna have full lividity like at the back side of your body um or like if you're laying forward it's gonna be all like you know, full frontal, or if it's on your side, obviously, wherever you're like laying down, wherever you're laying down, it's going to fix to that area. But the forensic or the medical examiner said that she had full frontal lividity. So that means if, if she was, if she was buried at seven thirty, like the prosecution says that she was, which was, you know, they say five hours after she was murdered and she was laid out like that, then her lividity would not have been, it would have been fit. Like, it goes based on like how you're like laid out. And so if she was laid out, it would have been like on her side, like down, like all down her side. That's the way that she was placed. So they, so because it was full frontal lividity, that means that she was laying face down for like eight to 12 hours before she was placed in the grave. Cause for it to fix like that, it has to be, it takes like eight to 12 hours for it to fix to that specific location. So she was laying flat down on her face for eight to 12 hours. So that doesn't even fit with the timeline that the prosecution's even pushing. Because if they buried her five hours later, then the lividity would be fixed in the position that she was laid in the grave in. Which isn't isn't that. Yeah, so it's another inconsistency. And like that was that brought I don't think that was brought up in the trial at all, was it? Like that was kind of brought forward after. Like they I don't know, they just didn't mention it, they didn't know about it. It wasn't brought up at all in the trial. Yeah, so which that is was like a- horrible. Yeah. If he had like a competent defense attorney, like she should have like brought the medical examiner, she should have interviewed the medical examiner to prove like that whole lividity argument. And if a jury heard that, like it'd be like, oh yeah. I mean, it doesn't, it's not like proof of like who killed her, because obviously like it's not what it's proving, but it's just proving that she wasn't buried at 7 30 p.m. 
Because again, the prosecution had to find, oh, there's cell phone pings from Lincoln Park at around 7.30 that night. So they had to have, oh, Anon had to be in at Lincoln Park at 7.30. So they're just like, okay, he buried her at 7.30, like based on no evidence at all. But if it's 8 to 12 hours, at least, it could have been obviously longer than that. But if it's 8 to 12 hours, then she wouldn't have been buried until like midnight or 1 a.m. So like the story that they're even pushing does not even fix what, does not even match like what the actual forensic evidence shows. So she was probably like laying flat on her face in like the trunk of her car or wherever she was laying. She had to be for 12 hours. Also, though, like she disappeared on the 13th. That was a Wednesday. And there was a huge snow and ice storm the next two days. So, I mean, they could have been snowed in. They couldn't maybe they couldn't drive her car. So she could have been in that car for the whole weekend. Right. And then like laying in that car for, for the weekend, they couldn't even get anywhere. And then after the snow cleared, the ice, you know, melted away. Then they went to Leakin Park. Such an awful long time to be playing somebody dead in your car without. Well, it was they... her car. They're saying it was in in Hay's own car. Oh, so, her I mean, car. I thought yeah, it was like they her... killed yeah. her, put her in the trunk of her own car, oh, and then like okay. left the car for like whatever the weekend or no, not even the weekend, just the snowstorm, which would have been Thursday, Friday, you know, and then went back to it on the weekend. And buried. Sorry, it. I thought I thought it was in um, Adnan's Adnan's car. No, because like well, Jay's. And I hate to use Jay's story as like anything like concrete, but Jay is his. They said that Anon showed him her body in the trunk of her own car. Obviously, it doesn't show like it doesn't prove who killed her because the lividity isn't like going to prove like anything about who actually did it. But it's basically just meant to prove that like she wasn't buried at seven thirty, like the prosecution is saying. And if she was buried like at midnight, and they look, oh, there's no his cell phone wasn't anywhere near Lincoln Park at that time. Yeah, and they did actually didn't even like do any DNA testing in the trunk of her car to see if she was actually in there. So, I mean, it doesn't even have to be that she was in her car. She could have been some other random person's car for, you know, 12 hours in the trunk. But they don't they didn't test anybody's trunk, so they don't actually know. So, it could have been somebody else's car for 12 hours. You know, and was 48, she strangled 48 hours. Was she strangled in her own car? That's what Jay said, but they don't actually have proof of that. Because if she was strangled in her car, like, she would have to be strangled, like, from the... Somebody sitting behind her. Because if she was sitting in the front, you can't strangle somebody. Yes, you can. If you're if you're sitting there, like, say if it was someone she knew, she's sitting in the passenger seat, or the, you know, in the driver's seat. Someone else is sitting in the passenger seat just having a conversation, especially if it was, like, you know, someone she, like, you know, was with, and they, like, make an out or something. They're, like, face to face. All they have to do is okay, reach like, over yeah, and they're... grab her. Yeah, if you're face to face, but if or you, they could have yeah, been in the back seat doing whatever and yeah, strangling okay. then, you know, like it, it's super easy. But if they're in the back seat, then the then that thing would have been broken off if the, she kicked it off. But it, was, it was, but it wasn't broken off. <laughs> yeah, it was that, taken, it, it was taken it off. Fit, yeah, but that doesn't even fit either. Well, the prosecution was saying that it was kicked off in a fight, so that would would have to make her in like the front seat, but yeah. like. I mean, just, you could you could still be in the back seat and like kick and get to the front yeah. like kick, your foot could kick out to the front you're if, especially if you're like just kicking wildly. I know that whole thing just shady to me. I, don't, I mean, not not that she was strangled. Like I believe that part. I just don't believe that. Well, also too, like the timeline of so the prosecution was going on that two thirty six p.m. was when the call came in from the Best Buy parking lot and they said that Anon made that call at 2.36 to Jay saying to come pick him up because he's killed Hay but school got out around what like 2.10, 2.15 so that gives like that gives him 21 minutes to leave school drive to the Best Buy parking lot strangle her put her in the trunk of the car and then call Jay in 21 minutes and I know in Serial too like if you've listened to the Serial podcast they actually drive the route from the school to the Best Buy parking lot and like they basically come to the conclusion that like well it can be done because they did do it but like it's very unlikely like everything would have to go exactly right the way that the school was set up at the end of school when you're trying to get out you can't even leave until all of the school bus is clear which usually say they say takes like 10 minutes for all the school buses to like clear the parking lot and then you can actually leave so like even if school got out at like 10 to 10 to 15 that's 225 before you even leave this high school and that gives them 11 minutes to drive to the best buy parking lot strangle her put her in the trunk of her own call, car and then call jay and yeah that that's 11 just, minutes like that 11 minutes is a very 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 small window yes to, to kill anybody. 
Well, yeah, and that's where that witness at Asia McLean comes in, right? Because, I mean, if you believe her, which I do, because they weren't even that close, her and Adnan, so she has, like, really no reason to, like, insert herself and lie about it at all. She says she saw him in the library at that same time that he was supposed to be, you know, strangling Hay at Best Buy. So it just doesn't match up. Like, everything throughout this whole thing doesn't match up. And the fact that... They never like called her as a witness. It boggles my mind. Cause she's like a one of the key witnesses. If she saw him at the exact moment they said that he killed Hay, then there might not be a case today. Because if she was testified against to say that she saw him at the library, I don't know how you can say he wasn't there. It's crazy though. They always go on like based on alibi witnesses or like if somebody has an alibi, okay, they check out, they move on to the next person. Well, that's a clear alibi. Like, they should have, like, checked into that. They saw his alibi, move on. It's not him. Like, for every single other person in this whole story, like, oh, they have an alibi. It couldn't be them. Well, he has a fucking alibi, too. You're not even, like, listening to that. Yeah, and, like, it, it doesn't make it's sense. it's also, the thing, sorry, the thing is, like, okay, the prosecution, obviously, it's horrible that they're, like, completely ignoring this evidence. But, like, okay, it's their job to, like, get a prosecution. They're not going to, like, bring that up. But for, like, his defense attorney, like, her name Christina Gutierrez, who's the worst defense attorney ever. Like, she was told about this Asia McLean testimony or like this witness. She was told about it, didn't even interview her, didn't follow up, and then told Adnan, Oh, yeah, we have, I've checked it out or I followed up with it, but it didn't didn't pan out or whatever. Like, gave this like bullshit lie. Like, yeah, she said that the, her dates were wrong, they didn't match up. Yeah, and it's like, what kind of defense attorney? Like, that's your job to, like, get him off. And she's this key alibi witness. Like, if you're any defense attorney that's worth your worth your salt, you're going to, like, investigate that. You're going to subpoena her. You're going to bring her into trial. You're going to, like, you know, have her testify. Like, that's, to me, it's crazy. And, like, like I said before, it makes sense that the prosecution is going to ignore it. They're going to ignore anything that doesn't do with their case. But, like, for the defense attorney to ignore it, like, that's even, that's the most egregious thing. I know, like, why? It does. There's no plausible reason why she wouldn't unless she thought you know maybe maybe she did think that it was just like a weak alibi and that she would it hurt her case in the long run by you know the prosecutor questioning her but maybe she just thought it wouldn't hold up but if so, someone... inst- so instead she goes with what like what was her argument like she didn't want to go with that because she had such a better argument with the other was the other argument i mean i guess it was the whole timeline like she was arguing that like it couldn't have possibly happened in that like 21 minute window which is like a strong case but like then you could be like well it also didn't happen in that 21 minute window because he was in the fucking library with asia mclean for like that whole time and the fact that she didn't they weren't really that close and for her to remember him being there at that specific time is something else too because why would she randomly randomly remember that like she they weren't even best friends or even that close so for her to remember that time, yeah exactly that's what i mean there's no reason for her just to like randomly say random yeah. shit and like yeah so and also and it's also annoying too it's one of those things it's like if only there was like surveillance videos of the library oh. that would, would like prove that i mean if there was she probably would have ignored it too but like it's just so annoying that like if it had surveillance video like you could just put it all to all to rest like that's you can't refute like video evidence yeah and they they were didn't they talk to the librarian and she said there was surveillance or something, but, like, it only was... They reused the tapes every week, so, like, by the time anyone talked to her, the tapes would have been erased anyway. And also, like, you had to... If you were going to use a computer, which Adnan did, you had to sign sign up on a log, which... A paper log. Yeah, but, I mean... And then by the time anybody questioned them, those logs would have been thrown out anyway. So it's just, like, if someone would have followed up as soon as Asia said something, then, you know, they they'd, they'd have maybe have a better, a stronger, you know, stronger case. Maybe Adnan should have got a different defense attorney. According to that librarian, though, like, because she went missing on the Wednesday, and then it was, like, a snowstorm for, like, the two days after that. Then it was the weekend, and then there was, like, another day that they had off. So, like, by the time, like, all of them were back at school anyway talking about any of this, it was already a week's up. And then the, the surveillance video would have been probably gone by then. Like, the logs were thrown out. Cause but it, there, was, but there was nobody there, so maybe they wouldn't have used those tapes, because there was nobody at the school for, like, four or five days. So maybe... Well, somebody but I think got... they still have to, like, surveillance it, don't they? But would like, somebody well, come in just to change the fucking tape <laughs> on a snow day in the middle of a snowstorm? I don't know. Yeah. But either way, like, when did Asia come forward? Like, how many days was this between when he was... Oh, I don't know. It, wasn't until, it wasn't until he was in jail already. Okay, like, it so it wouldn't have mattered, I guess, anyway. By the time anyone... Even if they did follow up, it would have been, you know, months later. Six weeks yeah. later. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, there was no hope, really, for that tape, because if they reuse it every week, like, 
no one was even like a week after that it happened. Like there was like they were still looking for Hay, but it wasn't like a full blown investigation. I don't think. But if they were doing their job from the very beginning, the police and everybody, like from the very beginning, they would have talked to Asia way sooner than, or talked to other people that were might have been in the library at the time or at the school at the time. Well, not if it goes against their their narrative. Well, yeah. no, but it's sorry. also, um, I think it was um, Serial again that had mentioned that the emails and stuff like that that he had checked, like if they would have like been on that sooner like they could have checked things like that like the electronic like digital record of where adnan was and what computer he signed into like you can figure that stuff out digitally right so if they would have just looked into that sooner before hotmail deleted everything then you know it, it just i mean back in the day when it was hotmail everyone had their hotmail account but by the time they would have like this was like years later and they switched over to outlook or something um and you're everyone like all my old hotmail emails are gone and so i think once your account is deactivated their stuff goes away right so his account didn't yeah, exist but like anymore. i think that there's like ways that like forensically they can pull up that data like it's just gone for you like as a user to like pull it up but i'm pretty sure like if the police wanted to find like old emails like i'm sure they could dig that up they, they talked to somebody that said that no they're i don't know maybe they could have dug deeper but whoever they talked to said that no there's no way to recover that kind of stuff but I mean, maybe in the 90s, I guess. Yeah, that's true. Like, if this happened, like, today, you could totally look up something like that. Because nothing's ever deleted, ever. You think it is, but somehow it's still there. I don't know, it's just, like, frustrating because I feel like the, the majority of people who, like, know about this case probably know about it from Serial, which, obviously, like, Serial, in, undis- like, in the documentary and stuff, they do mention that Serial was really good in, like, bringing awareness to the case, but it's, like, I don't know, I feel like there's so much stuff that they kind of glossed over, or though you said maybe it just came out later, um, and they didn't know it at the time of Serial, because Serial came out in, like, 2014, it's not, like, seven years ago from this recording, so it's, obviously, stuff's coming out, but all that stuff about, like, the grass analysis and, like, all of this other stuff, like, that would have been stuff that, like, they could have, that they did at the time, like, all of that initial investigation like taking pictures of her car and like the steering column thing being like taken off instead of broken off like that's all stuff that was available they just didn't really talk about it in serial and i feel like i don't know i just i feel like like serial was really good and like they did a good job of telling the story but i think they just tried to go with like the the kind of like the mystery angle versus just presenting it as like he's innocent because even them they don't even know like at the end like they're like well we don't really know yeah, I think it was trying to be like represent both sides rather than more of a one sided, which everything else that comes out seems to be, you know, pro ad non. So I think, and this was the first one, so maybe she was just trying to represent both sides evenly. Yeah, and it's like, I guess, but I can't even think of like one thing on the other side. I, I, I think we talked about it briefly, but the Nisha call was like the one thing in serial that they mentioned too of like, it's the one thing we couldn't get over. Like, we can't explain it. We don't really know. And like, that's the one thing on the on the other side, you could be like, okay, it does look kind of shady, but if it's a butt dial or I don't know, like that whole thing, it's like, you can't really explain, but I feel like everything else that is presented can be explained away by like forensic evidence or like witness testimony or something. I feel like there's very few arguments that you could make against Adnan that isn't going to be like completely debunked by actual evidence. Yeah, and this one phone call isn't like the smoking gun. Like, that's not the only piece of evidence you need to be like, yeah, he definitely did it. It's just like a thing that doesn't look good for him. Unfortunate, you know, coincidence probably that this happened at a time when it seems suspicious. But it's definitely not like, yeah, because of this, he definitely did it. Because because there's so much other stuff that just, on top of that, there's no way. Well, like, and like... I was just going to say, and like for those of you who don't really know, but the Nisha call was like, it was a call that was made from Adnan's phone around the time um like it was during that afternoon and it was nisha was a friend of adnan's and um they say that or nisha says that she spoke with adnan um on that day when he called her and she also spoke with jay and adnan said oh jay's here too like want to say hi to jay or whatever so she said that she spoke to both of them on that afternoon which puts both of them together on that afternoon which is like what again against what which is against like what the Anon saying and all that stuff. So it's like the one thing that like kind of looks bad, but also if it was a butt dial, it was like a two, it was like, it was like two minutes and 22 seconds was the call. And I don't know if that was like, if she's confusing her days and like, she doesn't know what day she actually spoke with them. Um, or if it was, I don't know. I don't know. 
Yeah, it definitely fits with the theme of like nobody knows what the hell is going on ever. Like every time someone interviews somebody, they say something and it comes out. Actually, no, that was a different day. They find evidence. Oh, I guess my memory's wrong. Talk to somebody else. Actually, no, like that was like last week. So like it doesn't. It seems like nobody can figure out what day stuff happened on. So this could just be one of those things where she thought she had a conversation on this day, but she actually didn't. And it could have been a butt dial, an unfortunate butt dial that lasted three minutes somehow, because she said she doesn't have. Um, voicemail, but I don't know. It, that's just it's that's so. Like, but piece. the is the thing is like so. Someone did, someone did answer the phone when they called. She doesn't have voicemail. Is it still going to be recording? Like, is it still going to say it was a two minute twenty two second call if no one answered? Like, it would probably just say it was a missing call. It wouldn't come up and say that an active call for two minutes and twenty two seconds. And if it is a butt dial, like, why is she going to sit there and listen for two minutes? I mean, maybe she would. I don't know. But like, it just makes it seem like someone did pick up someone they was talking and like jay didn't know nisha at all so he's he's not going to be calling her for any reason so it makes sense that adnan would call her and she says she also spoke to jay then it puts them together on that afternoon but i don't know i just think like it's one thing that it's like can't really explain it unless it's a butt dial but also like when you look at when you put that one thing against like 20 other things it's like i'm not it still like doesn't really have any bearing on me for like what I still think he's innocent. I don't think the Nisha call really has anything to do with anything. Like that's just kind of like a weird detail that I can't really make sense of, but doesn't really change my opinion at all. Yeah, like that's what I was gonna say. Um, there's nothing significant to me that makes him guilty of murdering Hay. But that yeah, like that one phone call is not doing it for me. There has to be something like super, super important or like this big evidence to tell me to prove that he did it. But there's just nothing there. So that does it for part one of our discussion of the Adnan Syed case. As you can tell, we're very into this case and we've only scratched the surface. There is another episode coming up next week and that will be part two. And we will discuss many other things that we didn't get to discuss this time. And our conversation continues. So um, we really hope that you'll join us next week for part two of this very interesting conversation and hopefully you've learned a few important details that maybe you didn't know if you just listened to serial or maybe you're now really interested to go and listen to those other podcasts and now you have a week to catch up on those and um maybe if you you know get into the case a little bit if you weren't really familiar with it before and we really hope you will join us for for next week's episode where we will finish our discussion so thank you so much for listening um if you like what you hear you can follow us on instagram at crime family podcast you can also follow us on twitter at crime family pod one we do have a facebook page now it's crime family podcast on facebook the amazing music you're hearing throughout the podcast is done by the awesome tim monis so you can follow him at tim monis you can um also make sure you can subscribe to us on your favorite podcast streaming app so that you're notified as soon as we release a new episode and and we have an email account now, so if you have any feedback you want to let us know about, if you have a case suggestion that you want us to do for a future episode, just email us at crimefamilypodcast at gmail.com, and we'd love to read the emails that you guys send. So thank you so much. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time for part two. Take care. <laughs>